So lots of little flocks, see how they're, they're, you see these are just, these are really little birds. They're about, like ping pong balls. Yeah, about the size of a ping pong ball. There, yeah, oh great, thank you, Emily. That's perfect. Oh, you can see that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. You see how it's woven? It's got lichens and mosses and little bits of prob probably hair or something like that in, in, in its nest. Yeah, it's got a hole at the top there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll stop share. I think you need to reshare it. Okay. Screen. Yeah. Okay. And then we're finished, aren't we? That one. Uh, then. Oh no, you. No, have no, no sorry. I got the specific. Oh, I catch her. Ah, you said so. Can you see the screen now? Yeah, we can see your screen now. Oh, good. Okay, we're going to the next one. Bird is the Pacific Slope Flycatcher. Pacific Slope Flycatchers are in a group. Are in a groups. They're kind of related to the warblers. They're all. All of these bird. These birds are a Pacific Slope Flycatcher. Is like its name says. It's an aerial insectivore. So it it sits on a branch and then it swoops down for the um, swoops down to catch insects. It turns out that the aerial insectivores, including swallows and flycatchers and maybe shrikes even, all of them, they're one of the most endangered groups of birds at late uh, in this decade. And they have, when Allison and I grew up listening to learning birding, they were super common. And then, people began to um, realize that they were actually declining. And um, some of the reasons for their decline, they're really declining fast. And they're, one of the reasons behind that thought is, is because of the use of a certain class of pesticides called neonicotinoids or neonics. And these um, pesticides, while they're not persistent organic chemicals, what they do is they prevent the insects from doing molting. And so the decline of insects has, um, has actually promoted the decline of these lovely little birds. And I used to have Pacific Slope flycatchers. They come a little later than now. Have you heard some? No, they're later. They're a bit later than now, so you won't hear them quite yet. But they come a bit later, and I've had many nesting in the forest behind me when it was a forest. And also, I found once a Pacific Slope flycatcher nest in a little cavity of a yew tree. And that was, but they used to really grace my whole yard with song a little bit later, but a plain looking little bird, but beautiful song. And these are another one of the species that you will hear before you see. That's the call. That's their call. Normally, yeah, what, what you, what, normally, normally what you hear is it's like someone's calling you. They, they, they sort of go, yeah, they're wispy. Yeah, like whistling. Like for someone's you. calling you. You turn around and no one's whistling for you. It's a look. It's a flycatcher. See if I can get a get different, different one. song. Yeah, that, that's not the common in my record. There, that's that's their definite call note. That's that's it. better. Yeah, that that's what you hear. Like someone's calling you over. Yeah, yeah, and they have that's a phrase. So that's how you learn that one is it's it's a phrase, not sort of it's not warbling, it's a phrase. And sometimes they're it's like they're asking a question, a little phrase asking a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the there's a bunch of fly catchers. There's one, the olive sided one is now on the um I think it's endangered. It used to be so common and it, it's one that says quick three beers, quick three beers but we don't see those too much. This, these one, this is um, the largest swallow. This is a, a swallow, two. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's the flycatcher. <laughs> these are uh, very common around our, our place now. And this is uh, basically, these are purple martins. This is a purple, the adult is the glossy one on the right, and the female is on the left. And purple martins, I always consider our endangered species success story. I was an endangered species biologist and it's 
it's somewhat of a discouraging job in some regards, although there's always work to do. But in but these purple martins um, came were in British Columbia came from about six pairs, and they nested in the Strait of Georgia. There was only about six pairs left. They're also in aerial insectivores. They actually feed a little differently than the other swallows. They're the these are the largest swallow in North America, but they feed up in the upper atmosphere jet stream, and they when You'll, but we are so fortunate they, they've actually returned and it wasn't that hard to re recover them because we just put up nest boxes. So what happened is that the European introduction of the European starling took away the um, basically the nesting habitat and also forestry took away the nesting habitat. These are cavity nesters and they nested in um, cavities of large trees and um, it, it, they do nest in the interior, but for some reason on our coast, they really seem to be focused on nesting over bodies of seawater. And we've, as they've recovered through the use of a nest box program, but done by a lot, George, um, you know, Bruce Cousins and his wife Charlene Lee have been really instrumental in getting them. So they've recovered from what was six pairs in the 80s to now we have over um, probably around 600 pairs nesting all along the coast, way up as far as Campbell River and far away, just from the use, putting up of a certain type of nest boxes. And if you go, ever want to see some nest boxes out on the dock that Anne Millington has and um, Heather Sinclair, that long dock, they've got some. I've got them on a post outside my house and at Newcastle Island is one of their bigger founder populations. And so they come, just at the end of April, they, they come and they have an most I consider them the bird of summer because they sing in the summer and I just hear them and they stay as well. These are migratory birds. They come all the way from Venezuela or in the Caribbean. I've seen them down the, in the Caribbean and then Panama in the winter time, but they come back here. So all these migratory birds are really, they're pretty, they live on the edge because they have to have enough fat storage to make that long journey from, from, you know, from South America to here. And when they come here and they arrive in the spring, they, they, they are pretty lean and they have to find food. And if the insects are down because it's raining or something, they have a poor year. But they, they have some strategy. It's a long story, the Purple Martins, but they have two sets of nesting. But the adult males, the glossy ones like this, come back first and they establish a territory by this song. And when I hear that song, I know that they've come back. And they came back this year about, I think about April 16th, or maybe even a little before. And then, but they fly around a lot, and then they actually establish, an, establish a nest. And then the, the same adult males will sing a dawn chorus. I think, I, is that the dawn chorus, Alison? I'm not sure. It's just a song. Just well, they'll sing that dawn chorus, but this, instead of being just territorial, it attracts the second set of younger males, which the younger one, the males, actually look a little bit like that female in that picture. It's hard, a little bit hard to tell them apart. And then the younger males will, will set, up a, set up shop. These are very colonial birds and they nest in these big groups. And the younger males will set up a nest and they'll attract a female. And then that adult male will go and cuckold there cuckold there um that female and he he will be actually the father of those those um those um babies of the eggs that are lay it, the eggs and then the babies and but that that the second year male will be the one feeding them so both parents take care of the young they go off in these huge for long foraging boats over way up in the upper atmosphere and they go long long distance flights and to bring back the food for their young but and so it's a big job taking care of them. So this is the way the colony works, but it's actually those older adult males that um, do the, that are actually the fathers of those chicks. But in a, a little while, the next year, the other adult male will get his turn too. Okay. Okay. We're almost done. Of course, we're not 
talking about all the birds that we could see here. But, uh, Trudy and I just picked the ones that had the most interesting songs mainly, or were just kind of interesting characters. So we're going on to this bird because it's interesting. And most people have seen these, the black oyster catchers. They're not really songbirds, they're waders. And they have a big, big loud call, of course, um, especially when they're, them, when they're um, displaying to each other. That's, that's what this pair is doing. It's a mated pair and they do this thing where they lift their head up and put it down and then they call. And they'll also just, they love to just, even during the nesting season, a bunch of them will just like do a fly around all calling together. They're really um, um, vulnerable birds because they're ground nesters. And so they, they really can't nest on the shores of anywhere that's inhabited. Like we don't have any nesting pairs on Protection Island. The nesting pairs are out on Snake Island. So all these little, little islands offshore here are super important. And when you get to a small island, as you go up the coast, almost every island has got a pair of oyster catchers. If there's any terrestrial, predators around at all, they're, they're really um, uh, threatened by those, but especially things like cats and dogs. Um, and raccoons. Raccoons, and, and also I work um, up on a seabird colony every summer and the ravens are just really hard on, on the uh, oyster catchers. Uh, anyway, but I mean, the, the native, there are native predators and but it's the non-native stuff the stuff that we introduce that can be really really um more harmful usually and at least that's something we can do something about by not letting our our uh, our animals even when they're on the shore feeding not chasing um, them on the shore because those feeding episodes are quite important for them and they're called oyster catchers because uh, you know because people thought that they just eat oysters they don't just eat oysters in fact the great big oysters that we have here are, they're mostly not feeding on those they're eating things like limpets and even shore crabs little snails um yeah so those are a kind of great and their bill is so cool yeah it's chisel shaped so that they can just tip those limpets off right off off the shore and yeah. they're Definitely, they're an indicator of a healthy marine intertidal area. Yeah, it's actually um, hard work and uh, quite a lot of skill to be an oyster catcher. And the young actually spend the whole first winter with their parents, learning learning the, the ropes of being an oyster catcher because they do have quite complex feeding. All right, and finally, the California quail. Um, again, not a songbird, but just an interesting part of the bird community of Protection Island. California quails are from California. They were introduced to Southeast BC and Vancouver Island um, between 1860 and 1912, um, I guess for as a hunting bird, but they've done really well and um, they, you'll see that they often hide out in little brushy disorganized places like the blackberry patches and um, you know as those disappear as we cultivate more and more of our gardens those little um, secretive cubby holes are are disappearing for them but uh, they're important because that's where they nest and that's where they um, that's where they dive into when there's any kind of predators around. So they, um, I read something interesting that I didn't know about them. A nest can contain as many as 28 eggs because the females are, are what they call egg dumping, where they'll, I guess they have a great capacity to, to just grow eggs. And so the females can lay their eggs in other females' nests. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes I'm sure you've seen in the summer when they've got their little chicks, like, a female will come out of the brush and there'll be like a dozen babies running after her. So that was interesting to find that, find that out because that seemed like a pretty big clutch for a bird. Um, 